Greetings AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here from the fabulous Avon High School. And we're gonna talk a, a little bit about our uh, idea of implicit differentiation in topic 3.2 from the AP Calculus CED. And we're just gonna run through example one and just give you guys a little bit of taste of what implicit differentiation is all about. So here we go. When you talk about implicit differentiation, the first thing that you need to think about is what does it mean for an equation to be written implicitly? And for that matter, if there's an implicit way to write an equation, then is there an explicit way to write an equation? And the answer is certainly yes on both accounts. So if you take a look at this table, in the orange column, I just have a pair of explicitly written functions. And then in the green column, I have a pair of implicitly written equations. Now the difference between the two hopefully is easy to spot. If you examine the two equations in the orange boxes, I hope that you realize that the y or f of x are by themselves. They're written all alone, in this case on the left side of the equation. And then of course the right side of the equation just has some x's thrown in. But if we move over to the implicitly written equations, what we see there is a mixture of x's and y's, all kind of like living together, mixed together like a, a nice, like tossed salad. And we can't really get the y by itself. So we're kind of stuck with these things being written implicitly. Well, the question then becomes, well, I know that we can take derivatives of explicitly written uh, functions, but what about these implicitly written equations? Can we take the derivative of those things? And the answer is certainly yes. And I'd like to give you guys a bit of a visual as to why this is going to be the case. So I'm going to switch over to my TI Inspire graphing calculator, and we're going to take a look at the graph of the second implicitly written equation. So here we are with our TI Inspire uh, graphing calculator. I'm going to use the software here. And what I want to do is I'm going to work in a scratch pad. It doesn't matter if you're in a document or a scratch pad. And for those of you who are not uh, uh, in the position where you own a TI Inspire, stand by because I'm going to talk about other places that you could go to graph these really wonderful implicit relations. So I'm going to choose my scratch pad button. Notice we're in the graphing scratch scratch pad screen. Now the thing that we have to do with most graphing calculators, let's say that you bring up a graph entry line which on the inspire the shortcut for that is hitting tab. What happens, whoops I didn't change this, let me let me pretend that it was showing up as f1 of x. I had it already set to our uh, new mode here. So if you have a situation where you bring up the y equal menu on your TI-84 or you hit the tab button here, you'll notice that it's going to bring up a function entry line. Well, that's not what we want. We are not going to graph a function here. What we are going to graph is that relation that I had on my notes packet, which I know some of you, if you're watching us outside of Avon, you don't necessarily have that packet, but it's that second equation that was looking a little bit like x times y minus some other stuff. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to hit this menu button, and I'm going to change the graph entry line to that of a relation. And what this will allow me to do is to type in an equation that has x's and y's all mixed together. So if you remember, or maybe you don't remember, I'll remind you, that implicit equation in the second line in that green column was x times y, it's very important that we put a multiplication between the x and the y, minus 2x squared plus y to the third, and then all of that would be set equal to x plus y. And you actually physically type in an equal sign. That's a little bit different uh, than what you would have done if you were graphing a function for sure. And if we hit enter, be prepared to be amazed because this is what the equation would graph. It's a very unusual graph that actually consists of two pieces. You've got this enclosed, 
I don't want to call it circular because that's certainly not a circle, but it's this enclosed rounded type of feature. And then you have this sort of trough style curve up above it. And lo and behold, if we were to find a nice ordered pair that say lies on this curve, like maybe maybe the point two two, if you look right there, the ordered pair two two could be a nice point on this curve. Plugging in two for x and two for y should yield an equivalent expression here. Needless to say, this would be very difficult to graph if you were trying to set up a t-chart. Now, if you're intrigued by graphing some of these relations that you might see in your classes and you don't have access to the TI Inspire, you can certainly do the same thing using Desmos or some other kind of graphical uh, uh, software that will allow the input of an implicit relation. So let's go ahead and return back to the document and do some practice with taking some derivatives of some implicit terms. So here we are taking a lo uh, look at example one here where the directions are asking us to simply differentiate with respect to x. So we have four parts to this problem, each of them just having a small little term that we're going to want to take the derivative of. So if we look at part a, the derivative of x cubed with respect to x, well, what we're going to do with this is absolutely nothing different than what you've learned before. You differentiate x cubed to get 3x squared, and boom, you're done. There's nothing else that you need to, to do or change. But if we look at part b, this is where things start to be a little different, because the directions are to take the derivative of y cubed with respect to x. And I'd like everyone to think about this for a second, because I'm going to ask you a question. What is it that you would want to say? if I asked you to take the derivative of y cubed with respect to x? Well, hopefully you're thinking, I want to say 3y squared. Well, guess what? That's correct. That's certainly part of the answer, but it's not the only part. You need to kind of um, extend this answer just a little bit more. And you're going to do that by using the chain rule. Well, wait a minute, why does the chain rule need to be used here, but yet it doesn't need to be used or apparently didn't need to be used in part A? Well, it all has to do with the name of the variable that you're taking the derivative of. If the variable is matching what you're taking the derivative with respect to, then you don't have to worry about the chain rule. But if the variable, like in part B, is a y and doesn't match the x, then you have to think of that y as being inside of parentheses and being that u part of our chain rule composite function, which means we've already taken the derivative of the outside part. Now we have to take the derivative of the inside part. And the derivative of y with respect to x is just that. It's dy over dx. We can't really call it anything else. Now, if you think about this even more, let's revisit part A. Could you have used the chain rule here? Well, that means you would have to take the derivative of x with respect to x. Well, guess what? We just did that. But the dx over dx is going to be a 1 anyway, so we never have to think about writing it. So in short, all you've got to worry about is when you come across a y term, tack on that multiply dy dx and you've got it taken care of. Let's go ahead and take a look at part C and D here to finish up our example. So in part C, we're taking the derivative of x plus y with respect to x. So you think of this as the derivative of x, first of all, and then you'll just add the derivative of y. Both are done so with respect to x. So our first one, dx over dx, is going to be, of course, 1, just as we'd expect. And then the derivative of y with respect to x don't overthink it. It's just the derivative of y with respect to x. You know, maybe you thought about putting a 1 in front of it because the derivative of a, of a single variable to the first power would be a 1, but it's not necessary because it's not going to change the value of dy over dx. Finishing up with part d. Part d is a little trickier because if this xy squared is seen, we have to realize that there is an operation between the x and the y squared, and that operation is a multiply. 
So whenever we're multiplying two expressions, both having variables in it, and we want to take their derivative, we have to use the product rule. So the derivative of x with respect to x is 1. We would then multiply by y squared. And then we would add x. And now the derivative of y squared, which is really what this lesson is all about, and that would give us 2 times y. And then you tack on dy over dx. The way that we write that expression there is perfectly fine. However, if we wanted to clean it up, we could rewrite it without the 1. And then, of course, the 2 could float in front of the x times y. And we follow it up with dy dx. Now, before we uh, leave here, I wanted to mention something about the dy dx's. Because a lot of students will ask, could I write y primes? for each of these. Is that acceptable? And the answer is, well, yeah, it's acceptable, but it might depend on your teachers. I'm never a big advocate of using y prime here because I've seen so many students make the mistake of seeing a y sitting next to a y prime and then all of a sudden in the next step that becomes a y squared because this prime mark can be so easily overlooked. But the dy over dx is a little bit more prominent in saying, I am a derivative, rather than the y prime. But just talk to your teacher, decide what they want to do. For my students, I prefer the dy dx. Um, and then maybe later on, we can lax that a little bit as we get a little bit more comfortable with it. Anyway, I want you to stick around for some future videos because we're going to start talking about how to take the implicit derivative of a full-blown equation and then possibly finding specific slopes of tangent lines from that point. Anyway, anyway uh, we thank you for joining, and we hope to see you next time.